all right. Let, let us let us be quiet. Honourable members, let us, let us be quiet. I just want to check. Um, let's settle down. We we are about to start. Uh, table assistants. Where are other table assistants? All, all, all members that attended on Saturday, Sunday, they must come here. Those who are arriving, the six learners must come at the front. There are chairs there. At the back, there are chairs there. Yes. Let's settle down. We are about to start. Uh, let me allow uh, Hansa to give them gadgets and we will start. We, we can start with the uh, ringing of the bell. We, we, are, we are about to start. Honorable members. Okay, we can remain quiet. We are about to start. Let's be quiet. When the procession come in, we will stand up, all of us.
We don't have participants up there. Those who are attending, oh, they're coming. Okay. Last reminder, let's switch off our cell phones. Let's put them on silence or switch them off. We'll start now. Speaker, all rise. Good morning, everyone. Um, I now call for a moment of silent prayer or meditation. Amen. Um, I now call for the house to sing the national anthem.
May now be seated. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the Honorable Mpapa Kanyani and ask him to declare the Laudanum Civic Center the precinct of the Gauteng Legislature in terms of the rules. Uh, thank you very much. I am Papa Kanyani, as the Deputy Chairperson of Committees, hereby declares Lodium Community Center in the city of Tswani as the precinct of the Gautian Provincial Legislature in terms of Rule 5.9 of the Standing Rules of the Gautian Provincial Legislature, Version 5, Revision 1, read together with Section 2.1 and Section 28 of the Powers, Privileges and Immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislatures Act Number 4, of 2004, the precinct of parliament or provincial legislature are described as follows. The precinct of parliament or legislature is the area of land and every building or part of a building under parliament's control, including the chambers in which the proceedings of the house are are held, and also the galleries and lobbies of all the chambers, every part of the building of which the chambers are situated, and every forecourt, yard, garden, enclosure, or open space where this can be held. Again, committee rules, rooms, and other meeting places which are really privileged to hold parliament or a legislature. Now, for the duration of this meeting, this place will be the precinct of the Gauteng Provincial Legislature. That's the standing rules of the legislature will apply and govern all engagements of today. Let me thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Mpapa Kanyani, for declaration of the precinct. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome the councillor, Ngetin Zwanana, and ask him to give the welcome address to the House. Good morning.
my name is Mweti Nzwanana, <clears throat> the Speaker of Council in Tswane, not just a council, but the Speaker. So in other words, we, we are sharing the same title. Honorable Chairperson of Chairs, Honorable Madoma in a essential, Gauteng Provincial Legislature Leadership, Representative for the Children's Parliament, officials from the city of Tswane, and all protocol observed. I welcome you all today Children's Sector Parliament 2023, as well as to the city of Tswane. The Children Charter clearly reflect the voice of the children of South Africa, be they respected and consulted in matters that affect their future. The Constitution also further elaborate on the freedom of speech, hence we have platforms such as this, one to facilitate conversation that can assist in charting the way forward in matters that affect our children. It therefore is exciting for me to be standing in front of you, our future leaders, today and I look forward to passionate debate that will be held today. These platforms are very instrumental in empowering yourselves through learning about the different environment each you come from. Learning from each other and sharing ideas and experience and most important, letting your voice be heard I therefore encourage you to make the best of today, but most enjoy yourselves as you have taken part in your conversation, in the conversations. I also encourage us as adults and various departments and institutions present today to listen carefully to the debates and possible solutions to the topics to be discussed so that we are able to go back and start implementing these ideas. The debate topics that will be held today are as follows. Exploring of possibi possibilities of formalizing aftercare services in primary schools in Gauteng. Two, the impact of school infrastructure provisions of quality learning and teaching. Three, assessing and pitfalls the benefits of Gauteng Department of Education's online registration. These are very crucial and thought-provoking topics. If we can find a workable solution to implement, implementing the proposals that come from these topics would have a covered a long way in making the lives of our children easier in school so that our children can focus on excellence in their studies and not have to worry about getting home when it's dark and still have to study and do homeworks, for example. We understand the load shedding is a reality and some of our children don't even have access to electricity in their homes. Therefore, aftercare services would be a beneficiary and would have a direct positive impact on the pass rate of our children. With those few words, I welcome you all and feel free in Tswane, relax, and may God bless you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Councillor Nzwanana, for the warm welcome. I now welcome the Deputy Chairperson of Committees of the Gauteng Legislature, Honorable Mbaba Kanyani, to address the House on the purpose and the significance of the sector parliament. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. And uh, let me take up this opportunity again and welcome everybody in this house. As the speaker has articulated. For now, I'm going to give you the purpose, which is very brief. The reason why you are here, we wanted you to be who you are. We wanted you to find yourself. We wanted you to talk to the issues that affect you on a daily basis. And we wanted you to open your own horizon. And we wanted that you grow leaps and bounds that your knowledge is not in a watertight compartment. We wanted you to be independent. We wanted you to find yourself. Because through this engagement, that is where you started to make reflections. You introspect and you improve on whatever weaknesses that might be there. But above all, we chose these topics specifically to change your life. The first one about the bullying at the schools. That is the purpose. That when you engage, we know that at the school, these things are happening. Now share and come up with possible options for resolutions. And we reflected on the issue of the infrastructure. Some of you, you might be learning in the shack, teen classrooms. So now, let's share that experience and tell us as policymakers and instruct us so that we become responsive to your issues. That's mainly the purpose. But now, I want also to take this opportunity. Because as the legislature, in our public participation, we engage you in your various capacities. Recently, We've just concluded the school debates on voter education. Where the schools throughout our province. And I'm proud to announce that the school that won in the province, they are here. And with their trophy. And I want to take again this opportunity that they stand up with their, pro their trophy and you applaud them. Lekwa Shandu. And thank you very much. And also for this positive response. I must tell you, the debates were so interesting. To reach that level, it's only the, not only the trophy, they got a lot of the, of the awards. There were presents. 
that were given that day, the tablets, the, a lot of things that they got. But they are here. So just to encourage you that whatever you do is not a futile exercise. And we have the speaker from Tswani Metropolitan Council. He didn't want to say it, but he promised that he's going to make sure that you also become the ambassador of the metro. Yeah. Now, without any waste of time, I want to wish you a very engaging, robust debate and interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Papa Khanyani, for your address. I would like to welcome the representative of the Independent Electoral Commission, Mr. Clement Ntailani, to address the House. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Uh, let me first acknowledge the Honorable Members of the House in the sector, our very important persons, and also the Honorable uh, Speaker of uh, Tswani Metro Municipality, who is present today, the Deputy Chair Honorable Mbaba Kanyani, distinguished guests, stakeholders of various institutions and schools represented here. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you. We are highly privileged and honored to be here today as the Electoral Commission. Clement Ntlailani is my name, as already introduced. Now, I'm briefly going to touch base on the importance of civic and democracy education as the IEC uh, addressing the House. And let me first start by saying that the IEC is an institution established in terms of Chapter 9 of the Constitution. We are a permanent body. We don't only exist during elections, but we are a permanent structure um, that is mandated to manage elections in all three spheres of government. That is your national, rather national, provincial, and municipal legislative body. And key to that is that we need to declare the result of those elections to be free and fair. And those res results must be declared uh, within a period of short, as short as possible. Now, as the IEC, one of our main key and key duties is to make sure that we compile and maintain the voters' role on a continuous basis, and not only um, prior to an election event. And we also compile a register of political parties that is also on an ongoing basis. Recently, we have learned that a new legislation has been passed allowing independent candidates to contest elections in the national and provincial um, legislatures across the country. And that's a first privilege that has never been um, undertaken in previous elections. Continuously, we need to promote voter education. And key to the institutions that are present here, access to different and various schools is important so that we can institutionalize the importance of voting, the importance of civic participation from as, as an early age at primary school level. It's also an appeal to schools represented here to allow us access so that we can inculcate um, messages relating to voter education, messages 
relating and platforms pertaining to voter registrations at school level. As a value, we are sometimes, unfortunately, um, mistaken to be another political party. But I know it's not the generation that is sitting here that has that misconception. Our values being impartiality and, and integrity, and also accountability and transparency, including responsiveness, are what thrives in every activity that we do, being it voter registration, being it managing elections in all these three spheres of government. We want to make an appeal to the younger generation that if you are 16 years and above and you have your identity document, whether in a form of a smart card, whether in a form of a temporary identity document, you need to be registered as a voter. It is your civic right that you need to be intentional about. Sitting here, I'm looking at future leaders who will take this country into heights that have ne we've never reached. And that begins with your participation as an individual. If you participate as an individual, it means even those that are around you would grasp and run with the same motto in their life. You only register once and you are registered for life, not unless you change your place of ordinary resident according to our electoral act, then you need to re-register so that the IEC can allocate you into a relevant voting station so that come elections, you know which voting station you need to go and cast your vote or express your views. Now, why should you register? So that the IEC can include you in the National Common Voters' Role. If you are not included in the National Common Voters' Role, it means you cannot vote. If you cannot vote, it means you are giving up an important fundamental right of expressing your view and your voice as a citizen of this country. It therefore means that you are giving that right to somebody else to elect who must be governance, to elect who must be speaker in your municipality, to elect who must be mayor, who must be the premier, and who must be members of the, of the uh, provincial legislature. A right to elect who must sit in all 400 seats in our National Assembly. And that is a right that you cannot afford to give away. Now, platforms to register and means to register. We have a network of IEC offices across the country where you can register to vote in person, which are operating from 8.30 until 17 hours daily. Our voting stations are also going to be open on the 18th and 19th of November to allow all South Africans to visit voting stations to inspect their voter registration status, and if not registered, to register as a voter. As a younger generation, you can also download the IEC application on your smartphone. How beautiful is that? The smartphone is, the, the IEC application is highly interactive, but you can use it as a platform to register as well. We also have an online platform where you can scan the QR code. We have a table at the back which has a QR code. If you are struggling to access the platform, you can simply scan that QR code and allow yourself to register if you have that relevant document that we are referring to. Now we also have special votes and that becomes very important, especially for our elderly persons that some of us are being raised by at home allowing them the space for the IEC to assist them during any election or if they need to be re-registered by reason of them moving their place of ordinary resident. Now, what has changed in terms of our elections? As I alluded earlier on, the electoral system allowed political parties only to participate during national and provincial elections. Now, Heading to 2024 national and provincial elections, our independent candidates or even somebody who's 18 and above can stand and be voted into office. 
we also have made an allowance as the IEC to um, have those that need to vote in any voting station, especially if they find themselves in an area where they are not registered at. They can visit any voting station and cast their vote therein. As I conclude, I would like to highly emphasize on the importance of voting as a youth, of participating in your civic duties as a young person. Democracy needs you. Democracy um, has the center of individuals and persons at heart. Democracy can never work if participants, and in this case, um, citizens of the country are not involved in the process thereof. So, as a young person, as an individual, as a South African citizen, democracy, it is the only means, or one of the important vehicles, especially voting, of you expressing your say. Without you expressing your say, democracy becomes weak, and that has been shown in our previous election, whereby only 35% of those that are on the voters' roll showed up to the polls. But I know the generation that I'm looking at now, right now will replicate our first democratic elections, whereby we had over 90% of participants that came and reported for voting. I wish to finally encourage you that as a young person, we need to uphold the values that we are taught by our elders. Our day-to-day -day lives should reflect the values that we learn at home. There is a saying, and I will uh, that children, you need to obey your parents so that it may be well with you. It will be well with your future when you honor and respect. Thank you very much, Mr. Ntlailano, for your address. I would like to explain to the chairpersons of the various commissions on how we will be dealing with the commission's report. I believe that during the discussions of commissions in the workshops, each commission agreed on resolutions that will be presented and tabled in this house today. I will ask the person designated to present the resolution of the commission and hand over the resolutions to the service officers after the debate, who will then hand them to the table staff seated in front of me. At the end of all the debates, I will hand over all the commission's resolutions to the chairperson of the committee of the legislature so that they can be tabled at the meeting and forwarded to the executive for action. Will the secretary please read the first order? Exploring the possibilities of formalizing aftercare services in public schools. I now call on Honorable Jessica Ngobeni, the chairperson of the commission, to present the commission's report. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Greetings to the House in its honorable posture. I am Honorable Jay Ngobeni, and it is a huge privilege to have the opportunity to address you today. It gives me great pleasure to deliver the opening of this report as the chairperson of the first committee under the discussion of exploring the possibilities of formalizing aftercare services in public primary schools. Honourable Speaker, the questions about the challenges faced by the children of the Gauteng province. Nelson Mandela once said that where they are born or the circumstances of their birth is the moral obligation of every one of us. 
So as we convened a seating in our commission, we asked us the environment that is stimulating and enriching so that we can produce a troop of well-developed, capable and competent future leaders. But let us go deeper before we go higher. It is beyond a fact that measures like early childhood development programs, good nutrition, and keeping children in school for as long as possible are the key educational investment areas for vulnerable children. Long-term development, social benefits beyond education, and employment opportunities in adult life are inevitable. Excuse me. Learners who are able to learn successfully are less. So, but however, this cannot be attained if the environment is not changed. This cannot be achieved until the GDE realizes that not only are numbers of young vulnerable learners of the Houghton province are facing a plight where the participation in learning is limited and is compromised because of the disadvantaged home environments and which, in which the basic needs are not met. So it would be completely absurd to expect high academic performance from these specific children. Children and for children that are in schools face a pro and are supporting our proposal for formalizing aftercare services in public primary schools. Let me say on behalf of my uh, commission that the main objective should not only be focused on improving the educational aspect of these children's lives, but should focus, we should focus on each and every aspect that makes up a child who they are. Kid President once said, if you make the world better for kids, you make it better for everyone. With that being said, I would like to hand over to my honorable members to elucidate further on our report. Honorable th speaker, thank you for the opportunity and thank you to the rest of the house. Thank you very much, honorable Ngobeni, for the exceptional speech that was given. I'd like to call upon Honorable E. Kanda, and I'd like to say that um, you'll be given four minutes, so don't be surprised when um, the Honorable Members in front of me will be telling you to stop when your time is up. Thank you. Good morning, Honorable Speaker, Deputy Speaker into the House at Large. My name is Honorable Ikanda, and I will be representing the basic fundamentals of what we stand for as a commission, in coalition with our motion, as well as the elements of aftercare services and why it is needed. What have we identified as a commission? We have identified that after school services haven't been properly introduced and formalized in public primary schools in Gauteng. We have an unruling number of children who lack out-of-school care. Now, this brings us to the definition of what is after-school care. Well, to my co-mission and to myself, after-school care is a place of rest, a place of relief, and a place of rehabilitation. Many children, once school has ended, have a place have a home where there's no parents, and a home with no parents is a home with no safety. They go to a home with no nutritional structure, they go to a home with no comfortability and no freedom. Therefore, we as a Commission One, we have decided that it is a must. Not only a must, it is a responsibility that we do introduce the formalization of aftercare services. Perhaps before diving into the characteristics of what an aftercare is, let us think, is it necessary? Should we have this? Do we need this? And the answer is yes, of course, it is necessary. We as Commission have re recognized that introducing this opportunity for learners in public primary schools and beyond will not only be a great opportunity, but it will provide comfortability and more. In my community, there is no library. And as a learner, I would like to go to a place where I can read and enjoy my book. And that's what we as Commission One are standing for. If we introduce aftercare services, then there will be more opportunities for learners to go not to only a place of warmth, but to a place where they know I can read my favorite book. We have also felt that by introducing this aftercare services, many learners who 
have missed or couldn't grasp, grasp a lesson in class. For example, you're with Mr. Mutetswa and he was teaching um, geometry and it passed you like this and you're like, oh, what happened here? You have an aftercare to go to, you know, this lady's going to help me or this mister is going to help me go through and this and this and that because I couldn't grasp it in class. And that's what we, again, are standing for as Commission One. It has also come up them for participating in unruly activities. What are we talking about when we speak about unruly activities? We talk about drugs, we talk about gang violence, and we talk about thievery, and a place that is safe. We have considered how many learners come from homes that are very toxic. And these homes do not provide the comfort and cookies. Who doesn't love cookies? Chocolate, vanilla, you know? Yeah, so, um, so by formalizing these aftercare services, the central port Mental health assistance be elaborated by the fellow speakers of my commission. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Kanda, for your speech. Um, I'd like to call upon Honorable C. Ziva. You also will be allocated four minutes, so just don't be surprised when my honorable members in front will tell you to stop when your time is up. Thank you. Greetings to the speaker, deputy speaker, and presiding officers, as well as the house and lodge. I am Honorable C. Ziva. Well, as previously stated by my fellow honorable members, indeed, there is an, a need for aftercare services to be formalized in public primary schools. But before we establish that, we need to first again establish the issue of their characteristics, which I will be dwelling on. As a commission, we have intensely looked at the fact that for the facility to achieve what is mentioned by the previous speaker, the center should have specific qualities which will enable it to attain quality results. First and foremost, the center will need a strong, dedicated leadership and management team because having or running a center involves having to negotiate external opportunities like beneficial agreements with funders. Community active involvement is key, whether it's a school or community-based Center. In many ways, the collaboration will promote long-term sustainability and ensure smooth running of the center. The benefits of serving food for learners cannot be underestimated. It serves as a push for more learners to participate. It also benefits those coming from under it, but also sensitive to children's triggers. It should include visuals, by that I mean pictures and posters, audios and objects so as to make the center accommodating for everyone with different learning styles. The whole idea behind an after school pro aftercare program is not just for learning, but also a safe and a fun space for kids. Remember that school is a second home for children. They spend six to eight hours, which is why having an aftercare located on the school premises is a good idea. And with that being said, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Diva. I'd like to hand over to Honorable Mafirika. Greetings to the Honorable Speakers, Deputy Speakers, and the House at Large. Okay, honorable speakers, I would like us to, under, to create an understanding. And after care, honorable members, a picture has been painted to us. And after care is a place, is a home away from home. Just like my, first, my second speaker has just elaborated, elaborated from us. So a picture has been painted of, of what an after care center is. And we've give, we have been given knowledge of, one, of what an after care center does. And why does it do it? And when is it going to do it? And how is it going to do it? But now I'm going to elaborate on the challenges that we face because when implementing aftercare, aftercare centers. In our discussion, we, have, we fully agree that aftercare centers are very crucial and very, and very beneficial for the learners. But we, we, we shouldn't shy away from the fact that it, it does come with these challenges. And the fact that there could be lots of challenges, could in, there could be a lot of challenges that could come up with planning and implementing aftercare services. Okay, the first challenge, allocating funds to spe specifically aftercare centers is gonna, insufficient fund can result in reduced staffing, limited resources, and compromised quality of care. We have, I've, in my investigation, I have found out that center, meaning that the parents did not have to pay, but the government did not intervene to help that aftercare. In 19, reports were made to the Wedela police station of toddler abduction and turns out that 
those toddlers were kidnapped by the staff of those aftercare centers. So we need qualified staff. We need to do proper investigations to find out whether these people are qualified to look after these learners. And another problem that we might face is transportation. Transportation can be a signif significant obstacle for abstract care services, especially for students who don't live within the working distance of the center. We, have, we live in an era of abduction right now. So think about the children that do not, work in, that do not live in the working distance of the aftercare. They might be abducted, and their crime rate would increase as the learners, became, the learners become missing. So in conclusion, aftercare services in public schools have faced serious challenges, including funding constraints, staffing and, staffing and management, space limitations, aligning with academic goals, and engaging with parents, and maintaining a balance between all of this stuff. So I have now painted a picture, and I have now given you challenges that we might face in implementing, and thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Mafirika. Um, I'd like to call upon Honorable Mtimkulu to address the House. Harvey McKay once said, time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. And once you've lost it, you can never get it back. Time. Time is very important. We cannot have learners sitting outside after schools and playing around and wasting their valuable time. We need to have proper working after case centers where learners can go learn and do something valuable with their time. Greetings to the Honorable Speaker, Honorable Deputy Speaker, the Table Assistants, and the House at Large. It is not just an honor, but a great privilege to address the House today. We as a commission have elaborated on what an after care is, the advantages, and the disadvantages. But now, what do we recommend the government do and implement to formalize and properly better the aftercare centers? Well, as my third speaker mentioned, the Little Smurfs aftercare that was closed down due to lack of funds. Some aftercares is places where learners just go and sleep, where learners are just given scrappy food for the sake of giving them food. This is not right. That's why we need to formalize this aftercares. There's an aftercare called the Clipton Youth Program, where they um, provide learners with a holistic approach where they cater to their physical, emotional, mental, and psychological needs, where they ensure that the learners get the best quality for their time. The government should consider doing research on other countries to see as to whether the aftercare should be school-based or community-based. The government could also run a probe on private schools to monitor and to check what they can do to better the aftercare centers in public schools. This will also help with the understanding of how best the learners can be taught in these centers. The government should also link this initiative with legislation and provide laws and regulations that will properly guide the aftercare centers and how they should be formalized properly. The ECD policies and the constitution might even demand that amendments take place. Um, there must be a link between the center and the school for smooth running and continuity. The government should also bring facilitators, facilitators that will come and monitor the quality of education and the quality of the center. Building a good quality website where all aftercare centers can register and have a record every single aftercare center, where it's easy to access what is required and to send the required documentation. This will ensure that everything is done in an efficient and timely manner. Also, needs of the learners. The government should also identify old school buildings or community halls which are not used, refurbish them and make them into productive aftercare centers so they can be readily accessible to users. For tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. I thank you. Um, I'd like to remind the house that um, before or when you stand up, please remember to bow as a sign of respect. Moving forward, I now call for open time and will only allow four participants to speak to the debate. Do not... Um, greetings to the house at large. I am Honorable Mabaso and I stand on Rule 77.7, .7, open time. Commission 1, I submit my request that you further indulge the house on a proposal to address how do various stakeholders come together 
to ensure collaboration as well as the success of formalizing the aftercare services in our province. Secondly, that you provide the house with information in relation to how it will be sustained in terms of progress and development. I thank you. Please see to it that you answer the questions in your closing report. Rules of open time section, something like Elena, might be adopted, but how? Because you go back to an aftercare service, which means that you're attending school, two schools at one day. I mean, how are you going to be able to concentrate at another school, which is an aftercare service, whilst you've coming back from another school? You're tired, you're exhausted, and you still need to go back to that school again, like traveling, going to an aftercare service at the same time. I am Honorable Rilebukhe Maitufi. I have arisen on open time rule 77.7. .7. And my inquiry is that uh, Honorable Maferika from Committee 1, he said that we need qualified staff as there is a case of child abduction. Maybe I didn't hear you correct, but my inquiry or my question really is that are kids not able to be taken against their own will, even if we have qualified caretakers, if you will? So my message is that really, I don't think we must sell, you know, a dream to parents that, you know what, they're safe all the way, they're self all the way. I mean, because it's like, that's what you were saying, that uh, we need qualified staff so that they may not be abducted, okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, thank you very much, honorable member. Open time. Uh, I would like uh, to interrupt on what a speaker here has contradicted on. My speaker, Honorable Maferega, has a home, and we've given you challenges. What could we face in formalizing an aftercare, which is we must institute it in a public primary school. So when you go up from school, you go to the aftercare center, not attending school twice. Remember your contradictions, listen, and then answer, and then stand up in interrupting. I thank you. Greetings to the house. I am Honorable T. Kafela, standing on... Um, Honorable member. For, for speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Greetings to the house. I am Honorable T. Honorable Kafela. member. That's going to go for moving forward. Um, I'd like to allow Honorable Ngobeni to give the closing report for her commission. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable that asked that she said they are tired, they won't have time to go to school twice. I would just rather touch on that. If you don't want to go there, don't go there. So, what are we looking I was I was emphasizing on my presentation that vulnerable children need this. There's a child that is in need of this. If you are content with how your academics are going and how your personal life is going, it's fine. And that is what we're pushing for, for children to be content, right? But we are saying, if you are saying it's going to stop their safety entirely because we don't live in a perfect society, there can never be total safety and all of that. And it's a truth that we have to acknowledge. But what we're saying is that it's going to minimize. And minimize is it's better than doing nothing at all. And in terms of sustainability, Honorable Mabaso, that is a very good question because once we propose ideas, we must look at the, the, the coming years or how is this going to be sustainable? How can this keep on going? But what will keep going is our love for the children. But if you look at the Department of Social Development, they were the first people to actually 
uh, uh, introduce these uh, measures in primary public schools. So what we're saying is that we want the Houghton Department of Education to come into the picture. So when they are collaborating together, the Houghton Department of Education takes their mission and the, the, the Houghton Department of Social Development take their mission and they interlink it together to produce BAM. So, so overall, the word that should be capitalized is formalizing or rather institutionalizing. Putting everything that my honorable members have said into a nutshell, the absence of formalization in these existing aftercare services is the absence of over main objective. And with that being said, I, Honorable Ngoveni, Chairperson of Commission 1, hereby move for adoption of Commission report in terms of Rule 164 and with Rule 117 taking into account all contribution made. Let us change the, the dynamics. Thank you. Thank you very much once again, Honorable Ngobeni. And I now call for a seconder. I, Honorable Mtim Kulu, rise to second our commission report. Thank you. I now put the question. All those in favor, say yes. Yes. All those not in favor, say no. <laughs> Majority rules, and the yes have it. The report is adopted. <laughs> Kindly hand the resolution of the Commission on exploring the possibilities of formalizing aftercare services in public primary schools in Gauteng. I now declare the debate on exploring the possibilities of formalized aftercare services in public primary schools in Gauteng closed. I now call for the motion without notice in terms of Rule 121. I'd like to call upon Tiseto Golano, who is the chairperson of this motion. Greetings to the house at large. I am Honorable Khololo, and I'm here to brief you about child abuse. South Africa is a signatory to international instruments such as the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and the African Charter on the Rights and Welfare of the Child. That offers statutory protection towards providing a better life for children over and above this, governments have a legislation and policies aimed at protecting children from exploitation. Children need special protection because they are among the vulnerable members of society. They are dependent on others, their parents and families, or the state when this fail, for care and protection. As a result, the drafters of our constitution have made children's rights a priority and have stated that the best interest of a child are the overriding concern when it comes to any matter affecting him or her. This section gives children the right to a name citizenship and some form of care. Children need food and shelter and should be protected from abuse, neglect and degradation. Sorry. No child should work when underage or do work that would interfere with his or her education or development. Children should be jailed only as a last resort and should not have to share a cell with adults. They should not take part in wars and should be protected during conflict. 
The second subsection, a very important clause, says a child's interests are the most important consideration in any matter concerning the child. In South Africa, protecting children from violence, exploitation, and abuse is not only a basic value, but also an obligation clearly set out in Article 28 of the South African Constitution, as well as the Children's Act. The Bill of Rights has a section devoted to children, and that does not mean that the rights in the other sections do not apply to them too. The sections that deal with equality, human dignity, religion, and health, as well as many others, are especially relevant and apply to children. There is also legislation that provides specific protection for children, and it includes Child Care Act of 1983, which makes it a criminal offense if a person who should maintain a child does not provide the child with clothes, housing, and medical care. Basic Condition of Employment Act of 1997, which makes it illegal to employ a child under 18. Domestic Violence Act of 1998, which defines different forms of domestic violence and explains how a child can get a protection order against the abuser. And Films and Publication Act of 1996, which protects children from exploitations in child pornography. Abuse is the improper usage or treatment of a thing, often to unfairly or improperly gain benefit. Abuse can come in many forms, such as physical or verbal maltreatment, injury, assault, violation, rape, unjust practices, crime, or other types of aggression. To these descriptions, one can also add the notion of the wrongness of using another human being as means to an end rather than as ends in themselves. Some sources describe abuse as socially constructed, which means there may be more or less recognition of the suffering of a victim at different times and society. Child abuse. Child abuse, also called as child endangerment, or child maltreatment as a physical, sexual, and psychological maltreatment or neglect of a child or children, especially by a parent or a caregiver. Child abuse may include an, any act or failure to act by a parent or caregiver that results in actual or potential harm to a child and can occur in a child's home or in the organizations, schools, or communities the child interacts with. And with that, I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. I'd like to leave the um, podium to Ms. Honorable Mpumelelo Mtongo. Mtongo. Greetings to the house at large. I am Honorable Mwong, and I'll be briefing you about all forms of abuse children experience and how they get affected daily. Child abuse refers to any emotional, sexual, or physical mistreatment or neglect by any adult in a role of responsibility towards someone who is under 18 years of age. It refers to any kind of action or failure to act that results in harm or possible harm for a child. The adult may be a parent or other family member or another caregiver, including sports coaches, teachers, and so on. Physical abuse is deliberate intention to inflict pain. When someone hears the term child abuse, most, the most commonly associate with physical abuse, wounds, bruises, burns, fractures, and sore muscles are signs of physical abuse. But abuse can also result from several acts of physical of discipline. Emotional abuse is a behavior towards the child that causes mental anguish and are considered as emotional abuse, also called psychological abuse. Examples of emotional abuse are shouting, are shouting often at the child, withholding kindness or affection, extended periods of silence and harsh jokes at the expense of the child. Calling the child names or making other demeaning remarks can be termed emotional abuse and usually result in low self-esteem. Neglection is when parents or caregivers who are continually unavailable for the child are considered neglectful. Even if the parent is physically present but unavailable or refuses to take 
care of the child or meet his or her needs, neglect occurs. Imagine a young child left at home for extended periods of time with no food in the house and an infant sibling to, to care of. This would be a good example of neglect. The warning signs of neglect include poor growth, weight loss, or supplies to meet their needs, stuffing themselves at one meal and hiding for later, or stealing food or money. Sexual abuse occurs when touching a child in a sexual manner or having sexual relations with the child in sexual abuse and includes any behavior towards the child for sexual stimulation. The type of abuse is characterized by fondling, forced sexual acts, and incident physical exposure. Whether the abuse occurs as an isolated incident or a repetitive conduct that continues for years, both types of are considered as sexual abuse or a child of a child, sorry. Abuse against children has lifelong impact or health and well-being of children, families, communities, and other nations. Abuse against children can result in death, lead to severe injuries, impair brain and nervous system development, result in negative coping and health risk behaviors, and impact opportunities and future generations. First fact about child abuse. In some countries, using corporal punishment is regarded as child abuse. Signs of abuse can be hard to detect, but being withdrawn, passive, and overly complained may be indication. The person who is ca carrying out the abuse may also need help, for example, a stressed person. Code by Nelson Mandela, the true character of society is revealed in how it treats its children. Thank you. Thank you very much, honorable member. I'd like to leave it to Honorable Tanek and Lovo. Good morning to the house at large. My name is Honorable K. Ndlovu, and I will be gi giving a brief on the effects of child abuse and the solutions as well. Effects of child abuse. Harm experienced in childhood can have a significant and lasting effect and children can respond differently to what has occurred. Children may experience a range of emotional, psychological, and physical problems as a result of being harmed, including number one, having low self-esteem. Number two, increased fear, guilt, and self-blame. Number three, distrust of adults or difficulty forming relationships with others. Number four, disrupted attachment with those who are meant to keep them safe. Number five, mental health disorders such as anxiety, attachment, post-traumatic stress, and depression disorders. Number six, self-harming or suicidal thoughts. Number seven, learning disorders including poor language and cognitive development. Number eight, developmental delay, eating disorders and physical ailments. Number nine, permanent physical injuries or death. Number 10, violent, aggressive or criminal behavior or other behavioral problems. Number 11, drug and alcohol abuse and high risk sexual behavior. It should be noted that for some children who have been abused, the impacts will not be evident in their behavior. These are the solutions of child abuse. Simple support for children and parents can be the best way to prevent child abuse. After school activities, parent education classes, mentoring programs, and respite care are some of the many ways to keep children safe from, from harm. Be a voice in support of these efforts in your community. Teach children their rights. The seven strategies are implementation and enforcement of laws, norms and values, safe environments, parent and caregiver support, in income and economic strengthening, response and support services, and education and life skills. That'll be all, I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. I'd like to leave the chair to Honorable Ziad Hussain.
Good morning to everyone at large. My name is Honorable Ziad Hussain. I will be speaking about 10 things you can do pre to prevent child abuse. Number one, volunteer your time. Get involved with other parents in your community. Help vulnerable children and their families. Start a play group. Number two, discipline your children thoughtfully. Never discipline your child when you are upset. Give yourself time to calm down. Remember that discipline is a way to teach your child. Use privileges to encourage good behavior and time outs to help your child regain control. Examine your Interruption. behavior. We proceed. Examine your behavior. Abuse is not just physical. Both words and actions can inflict deep, lasting wounds. Be a nurturing parent. Use your actions to show children and other adults that conflicts can be settled without hitting or yelling. Educate yourself and others. Simple support for children and parents can be the best way to prevent child abuse. After school activities. Parent education classes, mentoring programs, and respite care are some of the many ways to keep children safe from harm. Be a voice in support of these efforts in your community. Number five, teach children their rights. When children are taught they are special and have the right to be safe, they are less likely to think abuse is their fault and more likely to report an offender. Number six, support prevention programs. Too often, intervention occurs only after abuse is reported. Greater investments are needed in programs that have been proven to stop the abuse before it occurs, such as family counseling and home visits by nurses who provide assistance for newborn and their parents. Number seven, know what child abuse is. Physical and sexual abuse clearly constitute maltreatment, but so does neglect or failure of parents or other caregivers to provide a child with needed food, clothing, and care. Children can also be emotionally abused when they are rejected, berated, or continuously isolated. Number eight, know the signs. Unexplained injuries aren't the only signs of abuse. Depression, fear of a certain, certain adult, difficulty, sorry, difficulty trusting others or making friends, sudden changes in eating or sleeping patterns, inappropriate sexual behavior, poor hygiene, and hostility are often signs of family problems and may indicate a child is being neglected or physically, sexually, or emotionally abused. Report abuse. If you witness a child being harmed or see evidence of abuse, make a report to state child protective services, department, or local police. When talking to a child about abuse, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. I'd like to give the chair to Honorable Snetembang Gosi. Greetings to the House at Large. Child abuse and maltreatment or neglect are serious problems that affect people from all walks of life all across the country. During 2014, the New York SCR hotline received 294,256 calls, which resulted in 156,515 reports being electronically, electronically transmitted to local departments of social services for further action. The SCR handled 262,000 database check clearance requests, 8,000 administrative review requests, and received 12,000 requests for, for information. The impact of child abuse and neglect is often discussed in terms of physical, psychological, behavioral, or societal consequences. In reality, however, it is impossible to separate them completely. Physical consequences such as damage to a child's growing brain can have psychological implications such as cognitive delays or emotional difficulties. Psychological problems often manifest as high-risk behavior, depression, Depression and anxiety may make a person more likely to smoke, abuse drugs or alcohol, or overeat. High-risk behaviors or 
sorry about that. Health problems such as sexually transmitted infections, cancer, or obesity. Furthermore, furthermore, children who are abused are at increased risk of abusing their own children. The state of New York, New York requires that certain professionals intercede on behalf of the helpless victims of child abuse by making an official report when they have reasonable cause to suspect that such abuse may be taking place. These professionals called mandated reporters are are in a unique position to help interrupt, interrupt the, com the complex and damaging cycle of violence that results from child abuse, maltreatment, and neglect. Thank you. Thank you very much, honorable members. I now call for open time and will only allow four participants to speak to the debate. Also note, that participants who are on the speaking list will not be allowed to speak during open time. Also, do not forget to mention your name and rule 77.7. .7. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Um, greetings to the house in large. I'm Honorable D. Matlo, and I'm standing on the Rule 77.7. .7. And I am going to add on word the commission was saying. Firstly, child abuse leads to many factors again, and it also, leave also, it also lives in the schools. In the, our schools, we find that there are learners who sell drugs. And those drugs, you find that those learners are being forced by the people they live in. And they are going through the abuse whereby they are being beaten, forced, or punished in order to be able to sell those drugs. And secondly, I'll be saying that, to be honest, what causes this uh, child abuse? And also, what about the children who are not able to stand up for themselves, who are not able to raise up their voice to be able to tell the people who can support them about what they are going through? Adding on what I've said about the learners who sell the drugs, I think that at the schools, there should be teachers who should continue or start to be able to talk to the children and to also be able to advise them about this. They should talk to the children who are selling drugs, ask them what is their situation, what is happening at home, so that they can be able to get help as quickly as possible. And I, with that, I say thank you. Uh, greetings, ladies and gentlemen, honorable members. I am Honorable B. Malinga, and I would actually like to ask the chairperson on, on something here that she may or may not answer. Uh, they've been raising point after point after point, but yet not being specific on how and uh, uh, these, these things will be implemented. They're just throwing them and not giving a room on how they're going to be implemented, who are going to implement this. They're just giving it to them. They're not even raising examples of schools. They're not doing anything except just giving us point, 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 and seeing what we're going to do with it. And also another thing that Honorable uh, here said, that, uh, that parents should teach them their rights. Sir, so I also believe that they should also teach them uh, their responsibility because as you're talking about uh, child abuse, the child can also abuse their rights if they are not properly taught about their responsibility. I thank you. Thank you very much, honorable member. Um, Chairperson, please, in the end, just share clarity on whatever was asked by the honorable member. Good day to the house at large. I am honorable Esther and I rise on the basis of section 77.7 .7 open time. I have a question for the chairperson. I heard someone say that um, shouting can be considered as child abuse. So does that mean corporal punishment is also considered as child abuse? Thank you. Honorable member. Um, good morning to the house at large. I am Honorable 
Ikanda, and I stand on the order 77.7 open time. What I've heard from uh, motion, motion without notice, your commission, I haven't heard any value come out. Like, if I was going through abuse, or I was feeling abused in any way, what you've said would not make me what, what you said would never make me come out or want to go seek help. All you've given me is the book version of what you think of abuse. You've not given me personal feedback, community feedback. You talk about 911, you talk about all these calls, but you're not talking about accessibility. Remember, not everybody can access the facilities that you've mentioned. Um, not everybody um, has the confidence, the, the, the thrive to be like, you know what, I'm being abused, this is where I should go. You haven't talked about things that we can relate to as youth. All you've talked about is the book version. And our youth of today is not really about the book version, we're more about implementation. So what I wanna hear from you is, how are we gonna implement this without being boring, without being scared, without having to read in a dictionary before we can identify what we can do? And I leave to the chairperson of the commission to answer or give resolutions to the motion. Okay, greetings once again. I am Honorable Kololo, as I said before. And like, I've taken all your questions to consideration, actually. And what you guys have been asking are like, yeah, basic facts, right? Uh, we've just given you like a definition of like abuse, like a book definition of it. We didn't go deep into details. And I would like to mention and answer all your questions right now. So the first honorable, uh, your, your question was not really a question, honorable Matlo. Yeah, you were like supporting and more. And thank you for that. Okay, can I answer to the second honorable? Yes. Okay, you like, does corporal punishment is regard as child abuse, right? Like, honestly speaking, it can come in so many ways. It depends on what's happening and how is the corporal punishment and why is it given, right? Because there's some kids who are like, can be like, you know, given that corporal punishment or go through corporal punishment, why they don't deserve it, you know? And that's considered as abuse. And some bad kids can go through corporal punishment and that's discipline. So did I answer your question or should I elaborate more? It's okay. Okay, to the third, uh, what's this? To the, yeah, third honorable. Uh, honestly, uh, with teenagers these days, it's hard to like stand up and speak for themselves about abuse. And like we can actually start organizations and hold group meetings and talk about this child abuse and encourage teenagers to stand up more for themselves, right? Yes. And like we can start uh, something, uh, I don't know how to put it actually, but we can start up, um, what can I say, a setup whereby you can like write down your complaint and everything and put it in a box without revealing who you are. And as soon as you start getting comfortable, you can start showing up yourself and actually standing up to what type of abuse you're going through. Uh, whose question did I not answer? Who? Oh, you like, we're just giving points, 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 points after point. Okay, with that, we are like basically, uh, what's this, explaining child abuse and giving effects of child abuse and also giving solution to child abuse and also preventions. So as my fellow honorables have said, we all had each part to explain. Thank you. And with that, I chairperson, T. Khululu, the chairperson of Commission on Motion Without Notice, Child Abuse... Interruption. Sorry. Honorable 
Um, before he talks, um, please in the house, let's maintain order while the speakers are speaking. Thank you. Um, Honorable Kim Kiza here. Interruptions uh, under Rule 88. Um, chairperson, chairperson. Um, we have to listen to each other and understand here. Honorable they said, Honorable uh, from they said, relevant curricula curriculum and effective management skills. Nonetheless, investing in robust school infrastructure is indubitably important for creating an enabling environment that supports, the quality, that supports quality teaching and learning. Now, a little background info as I, a little background info as I wrap up. Pardon, my laptop is having problems. Post-1994 education was called on to address and respond to the needs of all citizens and to the social and economic development imperatives of the new democratic dispersion. That was a great anticipation that educational system would be greatly transformed for the better by dismantling the apartheid order and creating a new system based on the Freedom Charter which states that all doors of, of learning and culture should be open to all. This is a clear indication that the, dem the democratic LED government is concerned and responsible on its people's education. Even to date, South Africa's educational system is still experiencing so many infrastructural development challenges. Although South Africa has made a, a significant stride regarding the provision and development of educational infrastructure, a lot still needs to be done, considering that education is no doubt a dynamic inst instrument of change. Person, I would like to request the House to not move around a lot, because it is an interruption to the speakers. But I now call on Honorable Mukwena to present her speech. Thank you. A good education is a foundation of a better future. Greetings to the House at large. Standing before you is Honorable Mugwena from Commission 2. And I would like to address the House on the challenges on school infrastructure. As Commission 2, we believe that our challenges are based on health and sanitation, security and inadequate physical infrastructure. We have insufficient classroom space where schools have limited classrooms leading to overcrowding and limited resources. There are schools in Gauteng, such as Galaxdal, where this one high school is a big feeder for a maximum of two primary schools. We find our very own educators overcrowded in one office or turning libraries into a staff room, where learners are not even allowed to have access in the library. This leaves us with the question of why was the library even built? We also have pumping issues with leaks and dysfunctional toilets. Schools have to cut the lessons early due to no running water, reducing teaching and learning time, leaving both educators and learners behind with the syllabus. Now, moving to electric failures. Schools experience issues with outdated or faulty electrical wiring. How can learning and teaching take place in a school with no electricity? especially in this fourth industrial revolution where technology is dominating. You find learners writing their assignments or getting their notes late because their school has to go to another school for, for copies or things re that require electricity. 
until the state, we, ha we still have aging infrastructure where there are school buildings that have been there for ages that cause incidents like falling ceilings and crumbling buildings. Taking Carlton Jones Secondary School and to Kulegile as examples of such incidents. Now, second of last, lack of functional laboratories. If these laboratories are not used as classes, then you find there are no equipment for the science, la for the science lab, nor computers for the computer lab. Well, that's our sad reality. Last but not least, insufficient maintenance and cleanliness. Neglected maintenance and poor cleaning practices in our schools can result in deteriorating conditions, affecting the physical appeal, safety, and hygiene of the school. Now, how do you expect me as a learner to come to a school that is not conducive enough for teaching and learning to take place? We are children, but we have dignity as well. With that, I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Mukwena. I will now call on Honorable Ndaba to please present their speech. Thank you. Okay. Good day to the House at Large. I'm Honorable Akona Nomfundo Ndaba. I stand before thee as a representative of COJ and a second speaker of my commission. And as a second speaker of my commission, I'll be addressing exactly what stops the levels of power in creating school infrastructure that will be conducive for learning and results in the smooth processes of teaching and learning. My actors will be the government, the students, and the teachers. Firstly, I'll touch upon the uh, um, concept of corruption. The misuse of funds as the budget given out by government officials ends up in the wrong hands and therefore it is not used effectively to address the issues around our infrastructure. We are aware as the Commission that 1.7 billion is given out to uh, school infrastructure operations. However, we'd like to challenge exactly how these funds are being used, its distribution and monitor its progress. Secondly, on the counts of corruption, it was Red tape. Red tape occurs in the concept of corruption as uh, physical facilities such as buildings and ceilings of a school take ev longer to be fixed even before or after, even before or during infrastructural development. The tender usually takes longer to be approved or the process of the development at a school is at a standstill. Secondly, deception. We as the commission are very well aware that our government has um, a lot on their platter and therefore we do not blame them completely for the lack of infrastructure. However, we do uh, identify them as an accomplice to the results of its failure. Teachers make sure that um, they do their absolute best to prove to the government that they are perfect. However, are unaware of the effect it has on the development of schools infrastructure. A prime example of this would be the constant checking of books. Department officials tend to believe that since learners are actively learning and actively taking down notes, then that means that school infrastructure is doing good. But that is not the uh, case majority of the time. On the other hand, departments are also deceived by the area in which the school is located in. Just because the school is located in an area where there's luxuries and high earning incomes of the families around, does not necessarily mean that the schools are doing well infrastructurally. Thirdly, the administration, the administration process. This hinders gravely on the development of school infrastructure. There are so many stages to simply address the concerns rising about the danger of school infrastructure. I have to tell my principal, I have to tell the SGB, to the SGB, I have to tell my district office, to the district office, I have to tell the head of department. And that process can take three to two months, or two to three months at most. By the time, someone's life could be lost, or worse, they could be injured or even worse, lost their lives, yeah. The administration process of rescinding a tender is draining and rather very wrong. Fourthly, and not last, is the continuous vandalism. I know for a fact that everyone here values the worth of money in this country. So when schools, uh, school learners are continuously vandalizing school property, do you believe that you will be giving funds to a school that does not have respect, no morals, no ethics, no professionalism in um, addressing the uh, school infrastructure? An example of this is Kalesto Secondary School. The government cannot keep providing um, funds, with, funds to learners or schools um, that do not understand that. Oh. 
Thank you. Apologies as your card was cut out, but that was a well presented speech. I will now call on Honorable Ndiko to present this speech. Thank you. Greetings to the House at Large. Standing before you is Honorable Diko. On the discussion, the impact of school infrastructure on provision of quality learning and teaching. I come before you with the question, is infrastructure in underperforming schools regularly checked to ensure what exactly contributes to the underperformance? Well, the answer is no. And if they are checking, rather than having progress, we are somewhat regressing. We have examples such as the lack of chairs in JB Matabane, which has forced students to use their tables, to use their tables as their chairs, to the point where sometimes even their tables are not available and you have nothing at all to sit on. We have other schools such as Badirile Secondary Schools, where students have to go to school in classrooms that do not have windows, not enough chairs or tables, with walls filled with graffiti. The bathrooms are also in the worst condition that you can ever imagine. Another example is Pumulang Secondary School and its neighboring school, Charlotte Matlake Secondary School, where students are sharing furniture and getting hurt to, due to collapsing mobile classes. I have a question. If I am a student and I enter class, there is no chair, there is no table, I am standing, the window is broken, and you expect me to come up with good marks. You expect me to concentrate in class, whereas I cannot concentrate. The wind is blowing in my face. I am standing, my, hurt, my feet hurt at this point. And if you as one student say, no, I can survive and concentrate in such conditions, my brother, you are speaking from a point of privilege and are rather inconsiderate of other students' well-being. It's like Honorable Ngobeni said, if I, if I myself, or wait, if others are not okay, I myself, who's able to cope in such conditions, shouldn't be okay in such conditions. Then we have Khalexdal Secondary School, where the Department of Education issued an order on the 8th of February 2022 to fix the dangerous infrastructure. Yet, we are on the 8th month of 2023. I repeat, the 8th month of 2023. We, and there's nothing of worth mentioning that has been done to the school. They just received tables, which those tables at some point are already broken. Because, Galog, the Department of Education is failing to provide quality furniture to the schools. This may not seem like a major problem to you because you are warm in your office, you have a heater, you have an icon, your window is closed, everything is comfy, come and good. And it is to us, we are suffering, we are not concentrating because we have to go through such harsh conditions. Why should you care about, why should you not care about our safety? Why should I earn the privilege to be safe in a place where it's supposedly supposed to bring a bright future to me? Because when schools, because one thing I can say is this, when schools have positive change in results, I'll tell you this, the department all of a sudden in a mile. You have money to renovate the school, you have money to do all of these things, yet you keep forgetting, not all of us is academically strong. A few key points that also leave underperforming schools not being regularly checked or are being checked but with poor results is limited funding. We do agree that the Department of Education is providing, uh, uh, um, is providing funding, but the problem is this. The funding you're giving us is limited, and rather the current implementation strategy is not working for us. Rather, we are asking that you come with a proper strategic implementation of those funds so we can see what's happening with the funds. A lack of accountability. If a student breaks something, let them be accountable for that, because at the end of the day, the government won't provide proper infrastructure all the time. There's lack of awareness. Who I am convinced, entirely convinced. Thank you, honorable member. I would like to declare the house to please switch off via Bluetooth because it is connecting to the wrong devices. So if you have your Bluetooth on as of now, please do turn it off. I call on Honorable Mshokwa, if I am pronouncing it wrong, apologies. 
Good day to the House of Last Engine. Before you is Honorable Moshoka Mugao from Commission to representing the Ekut Leno region. What can be done to address the issue of school infrastructure? Well, we need to stop learners from vandalizing the school property. We can have the you break, you pay rule. Now, this rule simply means that if a learner is caught damaging or breaking a school property, then that learner has to pay for it back. And also, it is crucial that we have programs focusing on discipline for vandals, but with limitations, of course. In Tembisa, we have a program called Siyang Muba talking about teenage pregnancy and drugs. Now, we also need this type of programs that focus on discipline. We need programs that make learners understand the importance of a good infrastructure in their schools. And also, we need to deal with the issue of funding and finance. Well, it is crucial that uh, we have the collaboration between the government and the private sector on financing. Partnership with non-governmental organizations. For example, Colombia and the private sector um, uh, organizations who pull resources and expertise. They can also help with the funding of infra infrastructure development. We also need a policy that um, prioritizes education and ensure adequate um, funding to, for infrastructure development. We also need to keep the community involved, engaging parents, community leaders, and local organizations in supporting education, educational infrastructure improvements. We need to in, um, Encourage their active participation through initiatives like parent-teacher association, um, community contribution, volunteering, and mentoring programs. We need to co-engage with the local leaders to make a school infrastructure a priority. But while we're at it, we need a proper allocations of of um, we need proper allocations of fund for maintenance that should be monitored. Records of where the money is going should be kept and communicated with the parents of the students. No one should be kept in the dark. Tenders should also be monitored. We also need to create a long-term plan um, for the maintenance and the improvement and also for the problem of overcrowding with building classes that accommodate um, the growing number of students each year. But also, uh, but, but we need to do something as students to protect our school infrastructure. We can look for um, sponsors on websites. We have a website called the GoFundMe website where schools can look for potential sponsors that can help with their inadequate infrastructure. We can also have sneaker day, shade day, and others, we, but not the one monitored by the principal and the teachers, the one monitored by us as students. The RCLs must be involved in everything that has um, that, that happens, including the discussion that have something to do with the school infrastructure. Now, we'll tell our RCLs that this class doesn't have a door. We want to fundraise to raise money to buy the door for this class. But the RCLs and, and the SGB representatives um, must have a say in the allocation of the money for the maintenance and, and ensure that it goes where it is supposed to go. There must be transparency and, and accountability. Ever since we started collaborating with the Houghton Provincial Legislator, they've told us again and again that we are the future of this country. Now, let's take matters in our own hands. Let us look for sponsors. Let's stop vandalization. Let's protect our school infrastructure. Let's show that we are indeed potential future leaders of this country, as our view is their vision. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to emphasize on the point of Bluetooth, someone's Bluetooth, Bluetooth currently, sorry, is connected to the speakers. So please do switch off your Bluetooth as of now. Moving on, I now call for open time and will only allow four participants to speak to the debate. Will not be allowed to speak during open time. Also, do not forget to mention your name and Rule 77.7. .7. Thank you. Where do I start? Honorable member there with the blue blazer, I recognize you to speak. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Greetings to the House at large. I am Honorable Beam Kari, and I'm standing on open time rule 77.7. .7. I have a question for the chairperson on Commission 2. Uh, one of your uh, speakers mentioned that learners uh, should pay when they broke um, 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 school uh, items. So other learners are coming from homes that are financially struggling. So how is that learner supposed to pay if they broke something? Because sometimes you might find that it was a mistake, not on purpose. Thank you. Thank you, honorable member. 
Um, I recognize honorable member with the blue hoodie. Yes, you may stand and speak. Thank you. Greetings to the house at large. I'm Honorable K. Makata, standing on open time. I would like to add on what the second commission has said. Even after all, um, Houghton known as the most wealthiest province in the world, in South Africa, sorry, it's suffering, it's in the top five of suffering in inadequate school infrastructure and lack of furniture. For instance, we have a primary school in Ikurlien called Takane Primary School, whereby people are sitting, are sitting in buckets whereby they are also comfortable and see no need on changing bed. And we also have a school called Hur School Rudeport, Rudeport, whereby the school has collapsed and over 18 classes were lost. This incident occurred in 2019, and it, it still now the, the school is without 18 classes. From 2019 till 2023, the budget has increased to with 38.9 billion, but the school is still not recognized. I would like to urge the Department of Education to give the, a budget report every year on how the money is being used and how it's going to be used in future. Remember this, investing in the, in, in the youth is investing in the future. South Africa is nothing without its youth. I thank you. Thank you, honorable member. I will now, yes, um, honorable member there, right there. Yes, you, yeah. thank you. I rise on rule 77.7. .7. I am honorable Adams. Environment influences behavior. I firmly believe that quality infrastructure, facilities, and programs allow students to thrive and explore creative, innovative, and dynamic ideas. As the age of artificial intelligence is rapidly expanding, having quality infrastructure is crucial in fostering and harnessing the potential for our youth. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Hopefully, the Chairperson, Honorable Chair, will respond to your question. I now recognize Honorable Member there in green. You may ask your question. You Thank you. Good day to the House at Large. Um, I'm Honorable Esther, standing before you, um, and I rise on the basis of uh, Rule Number 77.7. .7. Or rule number, yeah, rule number 77.7. .7. I'd just like to add on to a point that Honorable Ndaba uh, brought about. She talked about location. I'd like to say this um, links with something called quantiles. So now with quantiles, it's like a level given to a, a school. So now um, schools in like uh, suburban areas are given higher quantiles than schools that are in township areas. So now this also links to insufficient funds. School, schools that are in township areas receive more funds than schools that are in um, suburban areas because of their quantiles. So now with this happening, they think that the, all the learners that go to that school in the higher quantiles, have um, all the resources they need and all that stuff. But then it's quite the opposite. Learners now come from places like Soweto and all that stuff, and they come to us, and people from that background usually do not have money to pay for school fees. So now the school in itself receives l um, little resources from the government, while schools in township areas receive more resources from the government. And now that school is staying there. Um, they, imagine they don't receive um, school fees from parents, and they also don't receive funds from the government. So how is that school going to operate if they do not have any funds coming in? So now I'd like to um, as I said, I want to add to that point. Another point I would like to uh, talk, mention is uh, that in the report, I saw that it's written that government is unaware of the problems that school face. 
that schools face. The thing is, government is aware. It's just that teachers are tired of always bringing up the same issues without government ever acting on it. That's why we need to use this chance that is given to us as the youth to make the GDE aware of the problems that we face. And there's also the thing of stakeholders' lack of knowledge. We as um, stakeholders, the, the school has the responsibility to teach stakeholders about the process of reporting problems concerning the school to higher powers. Thank you. That is for speakers, I apologize. Um, interruption, you're granted. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, for this opportunity. I'm rising on Rule 77 on interrupt, Rule 88, actually, on interruptions. I'd like to answer Honorable Makata. The GDE does give a budget report every year. Watch the news. Thank you. Order, Honorable Members, refrain from making noise, and applause is just enough. You don't have to yell. Thank you. Honorable members, please refrain from making noise. I repeat again, please refrain from making noise. Honorable member Mukombo, please reply to the debate and move for the adoption of the commission's report. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Honorable Ngobeni. Ouch. So, uh, Honorable uh, Mkari. Mkari, okay, good. How is a student supposed to pay if they come from a poor background? And what if it was a mistake? I believe the third speaker did say intentionally. They did say intentionally. <laughs> Thank you. And I would also like to ask Nen. Lopa with this, I say, uh, if we're asking questions like this, for a, how is this supposed to pay? Why are we being lenient? Are we not looking for a way forward? So why are we being lenient? If the solutions proposed are now being negated without, uh, negated without a way forward, without another solution, what's the point? It, I may not be answered, it's fine. Um, uh, the, 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 how many people spoke again? I, I, so, the Honorable Makata, you mem Honorable over there in the in the transparent glasses, <laughs> and the no, they are trans the color is transparent, and then <laughs> and the fourth speaker, um, yeah. and oh yes, you mem Honorable mem, you're very cute. Um, I believe you were adding on to my point, so thank you. Thank you ever so much. Thank you. So with that being said, in conclusion, the impact of school infrastructure on the provision of quality learning and teaching cannot be understated. Access to quality school infrastructure is not equitable worldwide. Addressing the disparities mentioned requires government support and investment in education to ensure every student has equal access to a quality learning environment. Adequate facilities contribute to a positive and conducive environment. Interruptions? Promote You're going to speak? Order, honorable members, please refrain from making noise. <clears throat> I greet you all, my honourable speaker, as well as my deputy speaker, and the house at its fullest of um, honourable members. Standing here by you is um, honourable M.S. Salieli. I respect you, my chairperson. I also respect you all. Your um, speaker said that um, the teachers are hiding the recent situation. I want you to answer me. The teachers are hiding the recent situation. How do you expect the government to intervene while the teachers are hiding the recent situation? Or you expect the government to do a, what? Um, private investigation about your schools to say, this is happening at your schools. Please answer me. Um, thank you. Back to you, Honorable Chair. Pausing my conclusion. I, 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 like, 
Yo. So, honorable member, ne, you are basically asking a question that is in our report. The question you are asking was answered. The question was answered. Okay, fine. So, we said that... So, Honorable Chair, please do address the House through me. Okay, my not, apologies. It's not a conflict. My apologies. You're not fighting. Thank you. So, it was in the question of our schools regularly checked. So Interruption. If, Interruption. Interruptions. Um, greetings once again to the House. Well, Honorable Chair, I was going to keep quiet, but... You did not answer my question. My question was, how will a learner, if they mistakenly broke something that belongs to their school, pay if their parents are not working or they are not financially stable? So you told me about someone who did it intentionally. So please elaborate more. If I did not do it intentionally, am I going to pay or not? Thank you. Just to interrupt, sorry, Chair, I will not be taking any more interruptions after the Chair, you're welcome, after the Chair is finished um, saying and responding back to the questions and points that you have all made. Thank you. You guys do know I have limited time, right? So, sir, on the point of mistakenly, obviously, if you didn't mistakenly, you're not going to pay. It's obvious. Honorable Chair, let's not fight. Speak through me, not him. Apologies, but my emotions are running over the place. Let me just take a moment. Time is up, Honorable Chair. Apologies. Guys, but order, please. I think we've gathered what you actually wanted to say. Yes. Please do, do please do conclude quickly. I, Honorable Mugombo, the chairperson of Commission 2, on the impact of school infrastructure on the provision of quality learning and teaching, hereby move for the adoption of the Commission report in terms of Rule 164, read with Rule 117, taking account all contributions made. Thank you. Whew, okay. I now call for a seconder. Mm. Um, honorable member, right there with the mask, I recognize you. You may speak. Greetings to you all. I, Honorable Mulebale, rise to second Honorable Chair Mukumbu. Part we've been all waiting for while well, I speak for myself. I now put the question, all those in favor, say yes. Yes. And all those not in favor, say no. No. <laughs> Should we do that again? Yes. The yes has it. The report is adopted. Order, honorable members, please. Kindly hand the resolutions of the Commission on the impact of school infrastructure on provision of quality learning and teaching. Thank you. I now declare the debate on the impact of school infrastructure on provision of quality learning and teaching closed. Okay, moving on. Will the secretary please read the third order? Reading the third order. 
debate on the in-depth analysis of the online registration for Gauteng schools, assessing the pitfalls and the benefits of the GD online applications in Gauteng. I now call on Honorable Tisane, the chairperson of this commission, to present their commission's report. <laughs> Greetings to the Honorable Speaker, Deputy Speaker, um, fellow Honorables, and the House at Large. I am Renela Tisane, Chairperson of Commission 3, moving with the motion of assessing the pitfalls and benefits of the GDE's online applications. Ladies and gentlemen, let us acknowledge that, um, firstly, for there to be a house, the house has a foundation. And for there to be a foundation, there has to be a plan. To not waste any more time, let me get straight into the topic. The Gauteng Department of E-Government made extended progress in the rollout of broadband connectivity within Gauteng province in 2014. Progressive happenings such as development and upgrade of eight critical nodes, development and testing of e-services, establishment of innovation hubs and cost-cutting telephony between GPG departments have been achieved. Nevertheless, challenges still persist in respect of ensuring the homogeneity and seamless approach in providing ICT infrastructure and services across Houthing citizens. The South African broadband in 2013 gives effect to the Constitution of South Africa by creating the conditions in the modern electronic world to advance the quality of life of all citizens and free the potential of each person. The declaration by the Human Rights Council of the United Nations General Assembly is that access to the internet is a basic human right which enables individuals to exercise their right to freedom and expression. The Gauteng Provincial Government adopted a 10-pillar program of radical transformation, modernization, re-industrialization with the aim of making the province an integrated city region characterized by social cohesion and economic inc inclusion. The department is aware that the 4IR requires an inclusive approach to stimulate innovation and allow citizens to develop applications. The department has perfected the plans to develop an e-services due to the ongoing demand and the COVID-19 also contributed to the need to work smarter and better in providing services to the public. A total of 39 e-services have been developed and contributed to making government services more accessible in the previous financial year. A total of 44 e-services are listed on the common platform to date. The reliability of the platform I apologize. A total of 39 e-services have been developed and contributed, making government services more accessible in the previous financial year. A total of 44 e-services listed on the common platform to date. The reliability of the platform has been maintained to 100% availability of the GPT transfer cell services. The department has the department resumes to support and advocate the development of innovation application solutions to bring government services to the public. Gauteng has an estimated number of 2.6 million students, where there were 165,000 applications that were recorded. However, only 161,407 of those applications were successfully processed by the online admission system for the next year. Furthermore, the department will maintain, enhance, and expand the e-services offerings on the Gauteng Digital Platform. The Gauteng Department of e-Government developed and implemented the Gauteng School Online Application System on behalf of the Gauteng Department of Educa Education in 2015. The purpose of the application online system was to ensure that the department has all information relating to, admi to admission in a central repository for planning and uh, reporting purposes. The application was designed to ensure that schools apply admission regulations fairly and equitably. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let us acknowledge that the GDE's long-term aspiration is learning classroom. This model builds on tech-enabled learning by employing more multimedia in this in delivery and creating a more learner-paced educational environment where the teacher manages multiple groups of learners working on different tasks at the same time. That way, a lot of learners can have more progress in learning in a short amount period. Now, I will hand over the rest to my fellow honorables to elaborate more. Thank you. Thank you, honorable chair. And I'll call on honorable Hegwa to present his speech. Much obliged. 
That South African flag um, next to our honorable deputy speaker reminds me that greetings are the most fundamental element of our nation. Therefore, honorable parliamentarians, consider yourselves greeted. I am honorable Clement Imagin from the third coordinated cabinet. Now, to be precise upon this concise matter, as a speaker expounding further on the benefits of GDE online applications, my submission is aligned with illegal coercion and factual coercion. GDE online applications GDE online applications are less costly and effective compared to Asian days when our parents had to utilize their equity through transportational expenses just to get to schools for application purposes, only to find out that the application that they were engaged in was unsuccessful, thus resulting into a wastage of their equity. Therefore, in terms of finance, there has been an alleviation. Proceeding without any deviation, neither procrastination in terms of the benefits announced by the Executive Council, Mr. Chilwani, with assistance of his spokesperson, Mr. Golani, GDE online applications are accessible on our miscellaneous devices. Alternatively, a homo sapien could conduct herself or himself with the local libraries or rather internet cafes with with, with the internet cafes or rather interruption. <laughs> Guys, please stop showing immaturity. Please stop connecting to the TV. You can't be saying, come find me, guys. And can we please limit, the, limit them going out? I think they are trying some tricks. Nobody's going out. Can we please stay in? Thank please you. Please also turn off your Bluetooth once again. Please. I'm extremely apologetic about that. Now, proceeding Pardon. without any deviation or rather procrastination. Um, the GDE, the, like I said, the GDE online applications are accessible on our miscellaneous devices. Alternatively, a homo sapien could conduct herself or himself with the local uh, libraries or rather internet cafes in order to experience GDE online applications that are unconstrained, thus accommodating majority of the learners without mobiles. With the predominant objective of speed and the velocity or rather the effectiveness of GDE online applications, bearing in mind that the applicants of GDE are not subjected to install GDE apps, but are rather granted with an access to GDE You may speak. I would like to start. Um, greetings, House of Legends. I'm the Honorable M. Nka Elang. Um, I would like to ask the speaker, how can people without smartphones, especially grannies, be able to access online res registration while they live in improper settlements like Makause in East Rand? You can never see internet cafe nearby and town is very, very, very far from, from the area. Thank you. Well, sorry, um, there was a second interruption from the girl in blue. You may speak. Honorable member, um, honorable member, the fellow honorable member is speaking on rule of interruptions. I think we could all just understand that because clearly she did raise up her hand and she did state. Maybe if you did listen as she spoke. Thank you, honorable member. You may proceed. Much obliged. Now, Joyce, the definition of what I feel when I got to elaborate your protestation, which is a hypothesis. If a library or rather an internet cafe is very far from you. It tells us that you are staying in an informal settlement. You shouldn't be there. Now, right. So, uh, my- Order, honorable members, please. Honorable- You may just applause. There is no need to make noise. Thank you. Honorable parliamentarians, uh, like I submitted, uh, this is a divine act uh, it shows, um, it's a pure demonstration of productivity, as the act is aligned with a legal coercion.
don't choose what communities we grow up in. Some of us are actually poor, and you cannot be telling us that we're not supposed to be there because we can't afford to get out of there. So. Oh. Thank you. I will not be taking any more interruptions. Apologies. You may proceed. Much obliged. Well, I must say again, it's a joy. Your definition, your, your actually your question brings me a satisfaction. Listen, if you are not supposed to be there, it means that you are doing unconstitutional activities. For, for heaven's sake, we are in a children's parliament. We are embracing the constitutionality. Like I said, the act is aligned with uh, the preamble of South Africa with the aim of honoring and respecting those who worked to develop our country, with the motive of improving the quality of life of each and every citizen, particularly our learners. The mission statement of GDE states that they are committed in providing a modern and functional school. Thus, the benefits of GDE online um, applications are attributed in reference of section 29 of the Constitution endorsed by United Nations International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights on the Rights of the Children, which implies that the best interest of children shall be at a primary consideration. Now, I would like to express a revelation. Even load shedding has a bright side. Even GDE has a scintillation within our nation. Therefore, fellow parliamentarians, let us vouch for GDE online applications and proceed putting more smiles on our learners, putting more smiles on our parents who are financially disabled. With a humble spirit, I submit my protestation. Thank you, Honourable Member. I would like to raise a point on the Bluetooth issue once again. Um, let's not be immature, okay? Let's stop playing with the Bluetooth option. Please do switch it off. What does that mean? All devices, all devices. Oh, yes, okay, that's a good recommendation, sir. Um, please do put your phones in that box. Because there seems to be an issue here with Bluetooth. Someone is playing with the Bluetooth. This isn't fun. And please order, honorable members, please order. May we also refrain from leaving the house continuously. No one is allowed to leave the house. The two honorable members that are coming in, you can't leave again. Since um, there is an issue also with um, people giving away their phones into the box, please do give your educator to hold your phones in the meanwhile and to also please switch off your phones because there's an issue here. I'll now be calling on Honorable Matsufi. Please do present your speech. And I would like to request the House to stop speaking and having their own conversations as other speakers are speaking. Thank you. Greetings to the House at large. Standing before you is Honorable Rilebukhla Matsufi, representing the city of Johannesburg. Upon my humble greetings, I have arisen to detail or elaborate a progress report of Committee 3, where my main focus will be on the pitfalls of the admissions process for the enrollment of Grade 1 and 8 pupils by the Gauteng Department of E-Services and Gauteng Department of Education. The first pitfall is that the admissions process is ineffective because of unfair planning, which results in overflow of learners in classrooms, as the system has failed to consider classroom norms and standards of those disadvantaged schools. While schools of the middle class and the, work and the upper class will adhere to 1 to 30 learners in a classroom policy. For example, Calfontaine Secondary School, which would, average an, which would school an average of 60 plus learners, which does not provision for effective learning and teaching and does not uphold the best interest of the child in line with Section 28, Subsection 2 of the Constitution of South Africa. Secondly, test requirements or scholarship are a ward of the working class and cannot afford schooling fees at a fee-paying school. Then an offering of a scholarship test would be made. In academic terms, should you fail, you are not guaranteed a space or admission regardless of placement offering by central planning of the system. 
This then leads the committee three to say that this system is in independent as schools may interfere with central planning, which is a violation of section 29, subsection one of the constitution. Thirdly, language versus demarcation. Learners home language versus where they stay. And I'd want to go to school, maybe in Springs, I want to do Swana or Zvenda. And now credibility. There are learners whom are wards or children, if you will, of the undocumented. <sighs> oh, sorry. The system requires South African documentation, asylum or visa related. Therefore, it means that you cannot school should you be undocumented. According to statistics essay, there are currently 1 million and 2,000 illegal immigrants, while South Africa has received 47.5%. I plead before the House, before you all ask questions, please. Please note that section 29, subsection 1, article A, states that everyone has the right to basic education, which does not only extend to South Africans, but to all who lives in it. The preamble says itself that we, as South Africa, we believe that South Africa belongs to all that lives in it. Therefore, the High Court of South Africa had made a groundbreaking judgment affirming this extension of Section 28 to foreign nationals. Lastly, the admissions process is lengthy as upon placement offering. You will go to that designated school by central planning and you will go and reapply with the same documents that you applied on the system because the school does not receive the particulars. Particulars I'm referring to documentation. They do not receive the particular documentation that you use to apply online. So you go to that designated school again and apply. Your view, our vision. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. I now call on Honorable Sive. Apologies for the mispronunciation, if I am. Greetings to the house at large. I'm Honorable Arsib representing West Rand in Commission 3, talking about the solution assessing the GDE school online application. Firstly, you had my fellow Honorable Maitufi mentioning the admission process that is ineffective right because of unfair planning, which results in the overflow of learners in a classroom. So the solution to that is the online system. It must create an infrastructural audit of that sort where they get to review the infrastructure norm and the classroom standards of that school they consider. So basically the government must be considerate of the, of the school they concede. So basically the government must be considerate of the infrastructure norm. The, the government must look at the classroom size and the number of desks, tables, desks, chairs that specifically class can accommodate. That is how they may assign learners in that way. They consider infra infrastructure standards of that school in Gauteng. So each school must Apology, accommodate... sorry. The people there, the honorable members there, please refrain from making noise. She is presenting a speech, and it is disrespectful for you to be having your own conversations in the meanwhile. Please keep quiet and listen. Thank you. You may proceed. The government must look at the classroom size and the number of desks, chairs, that specific class can accommodate. That way, they may assign learners. They must consider infrastructure standards of that school in Gauteng. So each school must accommodate 40 to 50 learners with, with 40 to 50 chairs and desks. Secondly, if you go to a school like GB High School for Boys, the school fees there is 50,000 per year. They will make you write a scholarship test should you not afford the school fees. They should eliminate that, and the Houghton Department of Education must be consistent with the exemption payment. What's heard about language versus demarcation? The choices are limited. The bathroom. I shouldn't be assigned in a, in a school. Um, I shouldn't be assigned in a school that do not offer me my prepared language of choice. For example, let me say I'm living in Kempton Park and I'm doing Afrikaans as my additional language. I want to go to Springs because I want to do Sitswana or Venda as my additional language. They will not even ask because I mean the system will assign you to a school that doesn't offer you a prepared language. The system must, must automatically take you to a school that is nearby that will eager you your prepared language. You also heard about um, document availability. Children of foreign nationals, they write in section 29, subsection 1, article A, that right states that everybody, everybody has a right to basic education. 
If the online system requires you to upload South African them t uh, documentation when you apply, let's say you are a foreigner, you don't have um, a proper document to apply, there must be a partnership between embassies, so they must apply with their visas so that the kids out there must also be schooled. So if we can allow foreign nationals to apply with their visas online, then we, eradic we eradicate long queues, then guess what? Guess what? it becomes an advantage. Um, the people of Houghton Department of E-Service and the Houghton Department of Education, they need to digitalize services, then I guess it shall become achieved. We believe that the online application must also be, must also be, opened, to, uh, must also be open to other grades, not only grade one and eight, I thank you. interruptions you may stand Thank you. greetings uh, to the house again I stand up on uh, rule 88 interruptions honorable came Kize you've un acknowledged that as then um, the speaker here is telling us about the infrastructure, the overflow of learners in school, how is that correlated with the in-depth of online application involving the GDE? Can you furthermore explain and note that down, Chairperson, please? And uh, further foremost, uh, uh, Honorable Maitufi was saying here that uh, your shouting simply means that you are fostering what you're saying for the House to adopt, which is not collated in the Parliament section. Read more further on the uh, sections, and then you'll get that. Uh, lastly, I'll just let's like be respectful as yes. we speak. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, honourable members, please be respectful and let's not be rude. This isn't us fighting. Mm -hmm. Thank I'm you. Fighting. Lastly, I would just want to say, uh, let's not contradict ourselves to what we're saying. Just understand that on the depth of online application, you have to come and tell us about how online application is making the system fail. Not telling us I have to be transported from Springs or to that section. How? Give us further more examples for the house to understand. Not just points again, points again, points. Just give, give us more information to understand. I thank you. Um, interruptions are limited, so apologies. I now call on Honorable Masang. Thank you. <sighs> Thank you, Chair. I treat the house at its almost fullest capacity. Can we please be, uh, be very careful on what we ask? Because, number one, we are telling you about the system and how the system is accepting learners uh, 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 an over limited amount of learners which is contributing to overcrowding in classes ladies and gentlemen distinguished guests esteemed members of this illustrious house i am honorable b Matlango, the, uh, representing the city of ekurileni in commission three which is assessing the benefits the pitfalls and benefits of online gd of the online gde uh, applications and I stand before you humbled and honored to deliver a speech that will ignite your minds and challenge your perceptions. For us to implement the solution rendered by my fourth commission member, we should open school finance management committees that will be able to manage the school budget transparently uh, and use the funds productively into providing technological gadgets for people to be able to apply. The GDE online application ha has, uh, reveals a complex and multifaceted uh, landscape, while the application offers a range of advantages. The, GDE, uh, the benefits of online GDE application are evident in terms of increasing accessibility, convenience, and efficiency for users. It allows streamless processes, um, faster communication, and improved data management. One of the most significant advantages of the GDE online application it is its ability to provide access to, uh, to educational resources uh, to a wider audience. It breaks down geographical barriers, enabling students, educators uh, from remote areas to engage in learning and collaboration. Furthermore, the convenience it offers cannot be overstated. Moreover, the GDE online application can significantly improve data management and analysis. It allows the collection of storage and analysis, and analysis of vast amount of educational data. 
oh, of educational data, enabling educators and policymakers to make a data to uh, driven decision. This can lead to more targeted interventions, personalized experiences, and improved educational outcomes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as Commission 3, we have not only given you the, ben the, the, the beautifuls, but also given you the solutions. Not only the solutions, but we've given you the benefits. Basically, we have given you the lunch, uh, the breakfast, the lunch, with, along with the snacks. And now, I'm going to hand over to my, to my chairperson to give you the dinner. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen, for the world is watching, and history will judge us not by magnitude of the obstacles we faced, but uh, by the depth of our determination to overcome. Therefore, we are challenging the perceptions of the house. May our collective efforts usher in an era of boundless possibilities and um, unparalleled uh, achievements. Your view, our vision. Thank you. That was a very powerful speech, I am convinced. Thank you, honorable member. But if the infrastructure is explainable, because Elena, you also touched on it a bit. I now call on honorable Disane. Please reply to the debate. Apologies, honorable members. I now call for open time and will only allow four participants. To speak to the debate, also note that participants who are on the speaking list um, on the speaking list will not be allowed to speak during open time. Also, do not forget to mention your name and Rule 77.7. .7. Thank you. Okay, I will recognize Honorable Ndiko. Stress. Um, greetings to the house at large. I am standing on Rule 77.7, .7, um, which is on open time. Well, I would like to ask the second speaker. I agree that you said something about informal settlements are unconstitutional because of some are in land they are not supposed to be. But Mem here, the honorable member here, did not say anything about people being on illegal land. Rather asked, Uguti, if I'm from a rural area, am I not supposed to be there? Which you said they're not supposed to be there. You understand? She asked, how do I access this? And in, on top of that, rather than answering her, you continue to insult her. And on top of that, the whole point of this is for us to be better than the people that are currently in parliament that are making a mockery of our country. So if you act like this and not answer her and insult her, you are rather no different from the current people we have in parliament. I would also like to speak on something you spoke about. Uh, uh, um, Honorable Sebe here spoke about Counting 40 to 50 people per school. We're already struggling with overcrowding. 40 and 50 is already considered overcrowding. But your speaker here said 40 to 50. So now, if you're preventing overcrowding, but yet you're promoting overcrowding, which one is it? Please choose a side. Honorable member, right there at the back, yes, you, you may speak. <laughs> Greetings to, to the chairperson, um, the adjudicators, and the house at its full capacity. Thank you, Honorable, for this opportunity. I am Honorable Al Mukhanazi. I am Honorable Elm Kwanazi and I rise on Rule 77 in open time to add on the topic assessing the pitfalls and the benefits of, of GDE's online application system. I am not debuting. There has been interesting and concerning issues and discussions about the Gauteng schools joining the digital revolution. While it's considered an improvement that there is GDE's online application system 
um, we are moving into a new phase of technology. But there are many challenges reference when uploading documents online. Online and specifically on the department's website. You might find that the verification processes are not taking place and they're delayed. Actually, and learners are not submitted to the schools of their choices. Or the preferred additional language as Honorable R. Sebe has already stated. And as well as Honorable R. Matifu, my Matifu elaborated on the statistical issue where only 64% of grades one and eight learners were submitted to schools. What about the other 36% to ask ourselves? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes, you, honorable member, you may speak. There's a mic behind you. Thank you. <clears throat> Greetings to the house at large. I'm Honorable Molefe, standing on room number 77.7. .7. Firstly, I'd like to apologize for my speaker there for feeling insulted and all that, I'm sorry. And I'd like to add on what my previous speaker has already said. Now, <clears throat> as we all know that there are rural places where grannies and parents don't have knowledge, enough knowledge about technologies and GD online application, there will be a working center where parents and grannies will go there to seek information about the GDE online application and be assisted in regard with the applications. Secondly, we all know that the system is failing us. We all know that. Now, for example, you try to apply, then boom, the system is offline. You go the next time to apply, uh, the due date is long past. Now for that, <clears throat> we live in the fourth century. Uh, we are really... <laughs> Other honorable members. Excuse me for that. You fourth may proceed. Industrial revolution. Now we live in an innovative world with innovative technology. So when you apply and then we find out that the capacity of the school that you're applying in is more, the system will give you options of different kinds of schools where you will apply for that specific year. And then the next year you can apply to the school that you want to be in. With that being said, thank you. Other honorable members. Um, yes. Um, honorable member with the beanie on, yes, you, you may speak. No, apologies, the girl besides you, yes. Um, greetings to the house at large. The person who stands proudly before your eyes is Honorable L.S. Mahlang. And I'm writing on rule 77.7 .7 on open time. Well, I'd like to add on, um, the Sorry, honorable members, the side, please let's not talk whilst others are presenting their speeches or interruptions. Thank you. I'd like to add on what um, Honorable Moitufi said. Well, I'd like to add on the pitfalls which falls under safety and security. The software is updated. The problem is the system. It is failing. The solutions that we discussed are supposed to better the system and the community. And the solution to the to the software is um, that we should um, implement biometrics. Biometrics need to be normalized, especially in places like home affairs, for example. The kids that don't have the necessary um, documents can imprint their fingers on the biometrics. Biometrics are body measurement and calculations related to the human characteristics. Biometric authentication is used in computer science as a form of identification and access control. It is also used to identify individuals in groups that are under surveillance. With that being said, I thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. I now call on Honorable Chair to respond back, but please make it brief as time is going. So, thank you.
Um, greetings. Sorry, Chairperson, please do address the house through me, not through the people I that am, actually... I am greeting again. No problem. Greetings, please, greetings. Reminder, to, thank you. Greetings to the house at large again. I am um, Arti Sani, Chairperson of the Third Commission. Um, firstly, I would like to start off by saying, Mr. Mkize, please, we, we don't want to fight. We, we are very respectful of each other and we all don't want to come out here crying. It will end in tears. And do not have data. It does not need services. Neither do service provide. Do you need to pay for data and all of that? Now, it is of great importance that all learners have the liberty to go to any school of their choice, no matter their home language and location. Let us do. Uh, let us do every student in Gauteng justice by giving them the opportunity to do so. As I close off, I, Honourable Art. All of my questions have been answered. My commission has come through for me. I thank you all for coming through for me and answering the questions. I, Honorable Arti Sane, the chairperson of Commission 3 on assessing the pitfalls and benefits of the GDE's online application, hereby move for the adoption of commission report in terms of Rule 164, read with Rule 117, taking into account all contributions made. I would also like to bid one of my honorables a happy birthday. Happy birthday, B.S. Matlangu. Thank you. Thank you, honorable chair, and happy birthday to honorable Matlangu. I now call for a seconder. Yes, honorable member, yes, you may speak. Uh, so greetings, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I, T. Mabuza, second the commission three. Thank you. I now put the question, all those in favor say yes. Yes. And mm. all those not in favor say no. no. Let's do that again. Just once. All those in favor say yes. yes. Just hear that. Wow. wow. The yes has it. Yes. The report is a dog. Kindly hand, kindly hand the resolutions of the commission. I now declare the debate, um, the in-depth analysis of the online registration for Gauteng School closed. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the honorable members for your contributions in the various debates. I would like to welcome the chairperson of Education Portfolio Committee, Honorable Munyai, and invite him to give a summary of debate and receive the resolutions. Thank you. It seems as though Honorable Munyai isn't here, unfortunately, to join us. So I will be introducing the lovely Honorable Member who has just joined me here. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
um, honorable speaker, honorable deputy speaker, and honorable members. Thank you. My name is Yvonne Dionerein from the Department of Social Development. I want to say that I acknowledge all the inputs that have been made by the various honorable members. I also want to acknowledge the valuable insight that you've given to us, and these inputs and points have been noted and will be taken back to the Department of Social Development for further actioning. Just on two points, Honorable Speaker, if I may, on the point of the aftercare services, just to note that as in terms of the Children's Act 38 of 2005, the Department of Social Development is compelled to uh, register partial care facilities, which is a community-based aftercare services, and that process is currently underway. In terms of in-house uh, aftercare services, the Department of Education would be expected to roll out that program. On my second point, Honorable Deputy Speaker, on the point of child abuse, I think it's a challenge that as a society in South Africa we're facing at, um, uh, at a level that is fast-paced. It's highly uh, a concern for the department as well. I want to note that we do have what is called a school social work program that is being implemented. Um, we're currently in the process of engaging in a memorandum of agreement with the Department of Education to roll out the school social work program. With that said, I'd like to pause there. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Okay, that was Ms. Yvonne. Um, who is the Director of Social Development, also Head Department. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. I now introduce Itumeleng Mpure, who is the Youth Director. Um, greetings to the house at large. My name is Itumele Mpure. I am Deputy Director in the Youth Directorate from the Gauteng Office of the Premier. The Gauteng Office of the Premier welcomes and acknowledge, acknowledges the debates that took place um, today. Uh, we look forward to um, receiving and hearing um, all the various deliberations and we encourage them. Uh, the deliberations that happened today go side by side with the Gauteng Integrated Youth Developmental um, Strategy. That strategy has five strategic pillars one of them is on enhancing education, um, strategic pillar number two. Uh, another pillar is on um, enhancing um, social coercion between um, young people. Another one is on physical and mental health um, awareness. Another one is on um, effective youth machinery, which we saw uh, in work today. And then we have another one on um, economic participation of young people. So the deliberations of today really go in hand in hand with um, the Gauteng Integrated Youth Development um, Strategy and we look forward to the increased um, robust debates that young people um, are, uh, are taking, um, um, are participating in. And we love and enjoy to see public participation at work and seeing young people live and go through uh, and see democracy uh, participation and it happening within young people. Thank you. Thank you. Continue with the closing remarks. I am done for the day. Thank you so much, everyone. Hello everyone, um, the debate was astounding and I now take this opportunity to welcome the Deputy Chairperson of Committees, 
of the Gauteng Legislature, Honorable Mpapa Khanyani, to give to receive the resolutions. Where the, res where the resolutions? Just, just a cent that we have been submitted. Uh, you see now, I wanted the resolutions. <laughs> now they are saying you are still fine tuning the resolutions. So I will, yeah, I wanted to be practical. And then thank you very much, uh, uh, the honorable speaker. Yeah, these are the resolutions. And then as I've indicated, that these resolutions, I'm going to hand them over to the chairperson of the Portfolio Committee of Education. And the chairperson, they are going to discuss them in the committee. Then from there, they are going to table these resolutions in the house. And, uh, yeah, Prince is there. When we present these resolutions in the house, I want them to be in the gallery. They must be invited to the legislature so that you witness when these resolutions are tabled in the house. And after they are tabled in the house, now they are resolutions they belong to the speaker of the legislature. Well, now they'll go send to the relevant department to respond to this. That's why we've got the office of the premier. Because the premier will make sure that those departments, they respond to these resolutions. Now, this is not the only session. We're going to have another session where there's going to be a report back on these resolutions. So we're going to report back to you. Now, I must say, your debate, what can I say? I'm intrigued. I'm flattered. You debated so well, and then you put your facts very well. And uh, I know even the parents there, they were really saying, can we have a rewind? Can you do it again? But now what I'm saying is keep it up. We're going to work with you. We're going to walk together this path. It's not just the end. We're going to involve you in a number of legislature activities. And on that note, I want to, uh, 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 before I hand over to those who is going to close, but to thank you, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Chairperson of Committees, Honorable Mbaba Ganyani, for, closing, for the closing remarks to this pristine house. I now call to the Councillor, Miss or Honorable Naeem Patel, to give her closing remarks for the day. Correction, I'm very sorry, Mr. Patel. I don't know if the legislature is going to wrap me around the knuckles, but halala Gauteng Provincial Government, halala. <laughs> Speaker, Honorable Ntombi Mekwe in absentia. Deputy Chairperson of Committees, Honorable Mpapa Kanyane. Speaker of the City of Tswane, Councillor Msidi Nzwanana. Council, councillors from the city of Chwane, Secretary of the Legislature, distinguished guests, the Speaker and Deputy Speaker of Children's Parliament, all the MPLs, Honorable MPLs, um, MECs, 
distinguished guests from the IEC, CETA, and other strategic partners, members of the organizing committee for this event today, ladies and gentlemen. As ward councillor for Ward 61 in Lodium, I'm greatly privileged and humbly honored to have been requested to extend a vote of thanks on this historic occasion of the Children's Parliament 2023, under the theme, following up on our commitment, making our future work better. I was in an interview a few minutes ago with uh, Pele, Pele FM from Atridgeville, and I was saying to them, the challenges of the youth of today is very different to the challenges of the youth of yesteryear. Some 39 years ago, I stood across the road here with a placard as a 10-year-old protesting for freedom and democracy. I joined the underground movement of the UDF at that time at the age of 10. We were trying to, our, our slogan was education before liberation. Today, I must say, um, honorable deputy chairperson, we can see the education of the last 30 years, the products of the education that we fought for. Thank you for that. The very presence of the distinguished guests, presiding officers, and members of the education portfolio committee under the stewardship of the chairperson, Honorable Munyai in absentia, despite your busy schedules, is a reflection of the importance that you have attached to the achievements of the Children's Parliament, to the Independent Electoral Commission, CETAS from the National Department of Higher Education and other strategic partners, we are indeed thankful for your kindness and participation to this sector, Parliament. I would like to take this opportunity to express our sincere gratitude to the Honorable Mpapa Kanyane, the Deputy Chairperson of Committees, who have tirelessly supported this project and made this event a success. How, how, what a name, Mpapa. He's our Papa. <laughs> <clears throat> I remain grateful to the MPLs and committee chairpersons for being here today to play an oversight role on the, of the committee in the correct part of education of the plans who received the resolutions of Children's Parliament. We look forward to the resolutions being processed and delivered to the executive. I recognize that these en engagements assist in deepening relations with key sectors of community that work with children's programs aimed at improving the quality of the lives of our people through the legislative process with a view to radically transform Gauteng to be a place where we can work and play safely. I'm thankful to the parents of the children for your support in the development of your child's future. Keep up the good work. Finally, let me take this opportunity to thank you, the children of Gauteng, for sharing with us our experiences. A few minutes ago, in the hall here, we had a young member of the provincial legislature Comrade Fasia Hassan. Comrade Fasia was a small girl. I think when democracy came, Fasia wasn't even born. 30 years ago. Today she's a member of the provincial legislature. She headed the Fees Must Fall campaign. That's not all. She's just not an ordinary member of the legislature. Fasia is the chairperson of the portfolio committee of COCTA. That means local government falls under her. We are, we are inspired by your leadership, my dear children, the discussions and deliberations that ensured today. We are indeed inspired by your guidance, vision, and passion on issues affecting children in Gauteng. When I see young children, I feel great anticipation. Thus, I would have not done justice if I did not thank the magnificent speaker and deputy speaker of the 2023 Children's Parliament and all participants, and honorable members of this parliament for your participation in this successful event. In council, I was telling the speaker earlier on, if we can have council run the way you run council, we'll have much more done. There, before the, the, the chairperson even says good afternoon, they're objecting on the good afternoon. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, special thanks to you, to you all for gracing this occasion. I thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Councillor. Mr. Naeem Patel. Um, participants are kindly requested to proceed to the front of the building for a photo session immediately after the sitting. 
you are also invited to join the GPL for lunch at the prepared place. <laughs> lunch. <laughs> that concludes the business for the day. The house is adjourned. Thank you, thank you. Uh, just a few announcements. We are going to remain seated. All of us who are going to remain seated. The members in the house, we are going to just change the table so that you can make your photo shoot. The photo shoot will be uh, done here, inside. After the photo shoot, then we will request the members to go outside for photo shoot. But the audience there, remain seated until we finish. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Let's, let's, let's move.